Hey everybody, welcome to confirmation that we're not alone in the universe, uh, but we're looking in the wrong place. I woke up this morning with this really interesting uh, message. It's basically saying that we're listening for the unheard. We've been listening to space for decades, SETI, Arecibo, the Allen Telescope Array, and more recently even amateurs with powerful receivers. We search for patterns, repetition, anything that breaks the background noise of the universe, that's true. But maybe we've been listening in the wrong way. Uh, we have. Maybe their version, them, of communication doesn't fit our human assumptions. Maybe it's not even radio. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Maybe it's neutrino pulses, quite possible, or quantum entanglement. It is. And maybe it's not meant to travel through space-time at all. It isn't. What if intelligent life evolved to stay silent to survive? Good point. What if noise means danger in their biosphere and silence is a shield? If survival requires you to be quiet, would your species ever dare to shout into the void? Uh, very, very interesting points. And it's about time that I talk to you about what's really going on. I've kind of been sworn to secrecy about this. There's a European group in the European continent who don't want to be public yet, but they have uh, fitted a new type of receiver which breaks all the normal boundaries. They've fitted a type of transmitter and receiver to their radio telescopes, which actually lets them communicate with extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, they don't want to go public about it yet, um, the technology is out there. I've already mentioned the inventor's name, uh, Gunter Nimitz. He uh, demonstrated this quantum tunneling technology to a group of uh, SETI people in Europe who said that they would give it a try to see if ET were actually using quantum tunneling technology rather than traditional electromagnetic radio frequencies that most of SETI are looking for, although SETI are also looking for very interesting uh, laser light signals and biosignatures as well. But I think the quantum tunneling idea of communication fixes so many problems. We as humans are still in our infancy. We still use the electromagnetic spectrum, radio waves. Remember back in the Apollo era, it took seconds to actually communicate with the people who actually did walk on the moon. The classic story was they wanted a shot of the ascent module of the lunar lander taking off as it ret as it blasted off from the moon and went back up to the command module in orbit around the moon. And they, of course, had the lunar rover with a camera which could be remotely controlled back from Earth, from Houston, say. Uh, but <laughs> what they needed to do is to follow the little ascent module as it took off. And to do that, they had to send the command to start tilting about three seconds in advance before they knew the, the lunar ascent mod module had blasted off to start the tilt mechanism working three seconds later. It took three attempts and eventually, I think on Apollo 17, they got it right. Here's some footage of it taking off. I noticed that the camera's tilting up. A lot of people have said, how did it tilt up? There must have been somebody left on the moon. No, it was a very clever way of working with the delay of the radio spectrum, sending the message to start tilting three seconds before the little craft actually ascended. And Mars, I mean, Mars is a major problem. Uh, Mars obviously changes its distance from Earth during its orbit, and it can be anything from 12 to 20 minutes away by light speed electromagnetic radio waves. And for that, there's an enormous latency when driving a, say, a Mars rover. You know, there's a rock coming up. Well, you have to tell it, say, 12 to 20 minutes in advance to turn left. And that latency is impossible. Humans really need to fix this. Uh, radio waves and radio communication only works r effectively over a few thousand kilometers. As soon as you get into space distances, space-time distances, you're actually coming across the 
boundaries of the speed of light and uh, it, the latency becomes ridiculous. Um, in a previous film, I talked about latency in flying drones. Um, drones are often flown from a base maybe a thousand to five thousand miles away, and they're controlled by operators with joysticks and uh, cameras looking down on the battlefield. And the signal is sent from, say, Omaha, Nebraska, up to a satellite, and then from the satellite, which is thousands of miles away, and then back down to the drone, and then the return signal goes back to them. Well, that is no good if you're a pilot. The latency in turning the control surfaces, the ailerons and elevator, of a uh, of a of a drone just wouldn't work. You would be so behind the loop that you couldn't do something like land it because you'd be a few seconds uh, in uh, in delay to the actual craft moving. The FAA have announced that there is a maximum of 20 nanoseconds as a latency for remote control vehicles. Anything more than that, the human brain just can't cope with that delay from putting the input in and the actual craft moving. So the military absolutely desperately need faster than light communication. And I'm sure they've been working on it. I mean, if you want to fire a gun remotely and a bad actor comes into view, you don't want to press fire bang. No, you need to fire it and it bangs. But that requires, at a large distance even on Earth, faster than light communication. And the best way of doing that is by getting out of the realm of physics that we live in, that we perceive of the light and photons and the electromagnetic wavelengths, and enter the quantum world, the quantum world being a subatomic world where everything is connected. There is no space time. Space in this quantum world doesn't exist as space. It's all connected. So a planet a million miles away is as close as a, a an atom, which is a nanometer away. There is no difference. Um, the way that you could make quantum communication work is by my analogy of using a rod. So imagine I had a very, very long piece of metal that is poking to the planet Zog, and I push it at one end. The end of the rod at planet Zog will poke out. As soon as I push it, there's no kind of compression or delay. As soon as I push it, it appears at the other end. And that's what quantum tunneling does, what quantum communication uh, definitely does do. It's been proven to work um, scientifically. Whether it's been used by the military or by SETI is another debate. But Quantum tunneling communication isn't faster than the speed of light. Never say that, because it's not in the physics that we normally inhabit. It's not in the world of electromagnetics. It's not in the world of photons. It's in the quantum world. So it's not faster than the speed of light. It's instant. Now, the problem with quantum tunneling communication is that it's not encryptable. Because when you send out a message into the quantum world, the probability of it being picked up anywhere in the entire universe exists. So it's not like point-to-point -point communication. The only way to encrypt quantum communication is to encrypt the message. The actual transmission cannot be encrypted because it is omnipresent. And you know, obviously, military have to work on that. But back to SETI. Um, so this guy, Nimitz, demonstrated in a university in Germany that the quantum tunneling technique works. He did it in the lab. His undergraduate students have copied it many times. You can do it. The signal enters and exits his transmitter and receiver with an air gap in between instantly, faster than light speed. In fact, it's instant. As soon as it goes in, it's coming out. So there is no delay. And that gap between the transmitter and the receiver can be infinite because there's a probability of it being received anywhere. Uh, you need to have the right equipment to make it work, but if you do have that, it overcomes an enormous hurdle. 
if you were speaking to um, an extraterrestrial race, say, 100 light years away at, with radio waves, first of all, you'd need a hell of a big transmitter to send out a focused beam to, say, Earth, and it would take 100 years to get here. We would maybe pick it up and say, oh, hi, how are you? And it would take that, would take 100 years to get back. That just doesn't work. If you're a super intelligent extraterrestrial race, you need to communicate instantly and not have that uh, barrier of space time. And the way around that is don't work in space time, work in the quantum universe, which is entirely connected, connected through space, time, and also the, the future and the past, which uh, we've talked about with distant viewing. So these people fitted um, initially, I think, quantum tunneling receivers to their radio dishes somewhere in the European uh, area and picked up um, extraterrestrial intelligence who were using it. Um, and supposedly, they then managed to fix up a transmitter and beamed a signal to these extraterrestrials. This is where it gets really interesting. The person who is involved in this project said, and it's very, very interesting what he said, is that utilizing the Gunter Nimitz quantum tunneling, transmitting and receiving technology is tiny as a problem compared with understanding the communication. He told me this story. Imagine you were a German school and you had a kid who was a Inuit from um, the Arctic came to visit and doesn't speak German and you don't speak Inuit language. You could still communicate with that kid by showing them a ball because probably the person from the Arctic had come across a spherical object that they played with. Now, the problem he said with talking to these extraterrestrials that he claims that communication has been opened is that they don't have any, any uh, source of reference. They don't know what a sphere is. They don't know what blue is. They certainly don't know what a ball is. There's no communication. There's no mathematics. There's nothing. There is no common ground. So how do you open channels to something, to a creature that has no reference to you? Um, I think there's a desperate attempt to send bits of information about humanity, mathematics, pictures, audio, anything to them in the hope that they, whoever they are, can interpret what we're sending to them. And hopefully, if they can interpret what we're sent to them, redo it and send us back in a form that we can understand in the same way we sent it to them, a message back. I mean, we live on Earth where we don't talk to cephalopods. We, we can't communicate with some of our nearest neighbors, squids. We can't talk to the cat, the dog, apart from guessing what they say. I wish I could talk to my sheep. But, you know, we're pretty limited in our communication because of the terms of reference. Um, imagine trying to communicate with an alien species um, where they don't know what light is. They don't exist, say, in a with color. They don't have a body form or gravity or anything um, because they're extraterrestrials. They're not like us. That is supposedly the enormous issue. But... The quantum tunneling technique is probably a very smart technique that extraterrestrials are using and that humans are probably going to uh, use themselves. First of all, military for instant latency-free communication, and then all of us eventually uh, will be communicating uh, with quantum tunneling rather than electromagnetic waves, as we do right now with Wi-Fi and radio and phones and things. It's just very, very basic and old-fashioned. It's only good for short-end stuff. Long-distance space-time communication needs other techniques. And the other, other source of SETI information, which I'm getting, is that somehow extraterrestrial intelligences use neutrinos. There is a connection between 
these incredibly small particles which have no charge, which pass right through Earth, um, uh, and billions of them are hitting us and the Earth all the time. Is there a way of encoding a signal into a stream of neutrinos? And there's a facility in the uh, Antarctic, a big neutrino laboratory, who are looking for wave patterns, looking for information which might be encoded in the amount of neutrinos that they're detecting. Um, again, it might be a source of extraterrestrial intelligence communication. So let's um, not <clears throat> just look at the night sky with our eyes. Let's not listen with our ears. Let's, let's not just use radio telescopes. Although they're all useful basic tools, let's think out of the box. Let's use quantum communication. Let's look at neutrinos. Uh, <clears throat> let's look at very, very quick sub um, nanosecond light pulses. You know, that's possibly lasers are, are used for shorter distance communication by extraterrestrials. There's some evidence that there's a number of lights, very short duration light flashes, which have been observed, which might be a, uh, a, a, a an extraterrestrial intelligence out there or a natural form, we don't know. But I can't wait to bring you more um, information about the quantum tunneling um, experiment, which is going on. They want to keep it really quiet right now. For, um, when you understand who they are and why they're doing it, you'll understand why they're keeping quiet. Uh, but they know about me. They know about this channel. They know that I like to spread that kind of word. And they are more than prepared to work with me <clears throat> when the timing is actually right. So viewers, you know, stay tuned. I have a lot of contacts. I'm old. I've worked in with a lot of scientists all my life. People trust me. People share stories with me. Um, uh, I, you know, I'm not a conventional media outlet. You will hear on channels like mine and other channels who are prepared to talk about emerging science and not just peer-reviewed science, interesting stories about things which are about to happen. And uh, I think you need to subscribe and stay tuned to me um, because you are going to hear more about how we might well be today having quantum tunnel communication with an extraterrestrial intelligence because the truth really is out there. <laughs>